بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الشف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم We concluded last week's lesson by making a start on the third chapter of Mishkat al-Masabih which is entitled in Arabic as Babu al-Wali fi al-Nikah wa istizan al-Mar'a which in English means the obligation regarding the Wali or the custodian in the Nikah and in the marriage wa istizan al-Mar'a and the obligation or the requirement of taking consent or permission from the woman or from the girl before you get her married. Now I mentioned in last week's lesson that the role or the responsibility of a wali or of a custodian or of a father or a grandfather is that of an advisory role, i.e. it's the father's moral obligation, it's his duty, it's his responsibility that he suggests someone for his daughter, he looks for a groom for his daughter, or if it's in the case of a grandfather that he looks for someone for his granddaughter, in the case of an older brother that he looks someone he looks for someone for his younger sister. So it's a moral duty, a moral obligation that you look for a groom for your daughter. But that's where the obligation stops. Because if you thereafter then force your daughter to marry this particular groom, if you then compel your daughter that no, you have to marry this particular boy who I have chose for you, and or you go ahead with the marriage without a consent, without a blessing, then that will amount to a forced marriage. And as we're going to look at later, forced marriage is, is something which is not a teaching of Islam and is something which Islam doesn't advocate and is something which Islam does not preach. So that's what is the role of a wali or a custodian or of a father that he should suggest someone for his daughter he should look for someone for his daughter, but that's it. If afterwards the girl permits or gives consent to the father and says that, okay, I like the groom, I like the boy which you have chosen for me, thereafterwards the proposal may go forward. But if the girl explicitly says that, no, I don't want to get married to this particular boy, or she implies or indicates or gesticulates that I'm really not really happy with this particular choice, then afterwards the father or the grandfather, whoever he is, is not allowed to force that girl to marry out of, against her own wishes. So as I was saying, that is the responsibility or the duty of a wali in a nutshell. Now we're going to slightly elaborate on this particular topic and look at a scholarly issue here. And the scholarly issue is that this requirement of a wali for the nikah or for the marriage, is it a legal requirement for the marriage or is it something which is desirable or mustahab? What I'm trying to imply here is that does a girl have to get permission from her father or her grandfather before she gets married or can she conduct the nikah and the marriage herself? Now according to Imam Shafi rahmatullahi Imam Malik rahmatullahi and Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal rahmatullahi they are of the view that the girl or the woman has to get consent or permission from her wali so it could be her father it could be her grandfather if the father isn't there if the father or grandfather are not there then her elder brother if the elder brother are not there then her uncle she needs to get their blessings and their consent before she gets married. And they also say 
that if a girl was to get married without their blessings and their consent, then her nikah and her marriage would be considered invalid and not allowed. And the relationship she then has with that man who she got married to without their consent will be considered as an adulterous relationship. However, on the other hand, Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi is of the view that if a girl or a woman was to get married without her father's consent or without her grandfather's consent or without the consent or permission from her wali, the nikah will be valid. The marriage will be done, the marriage will be valid. However, it will be considered disliked for two reasons. The first reason is that for a girl to get married out of her own accord or out of her own will without getting consultation from her parents or from her father, then that is considered to a certain extent against modesty and against haya. For a girl to do something like that without asking her parents and she just like runs away with a boy and then gets married, that is considered very immoral and that is considered against haya. So that's one reason why it will be considered disliked. And another reason, and this is the main reason why it's considered disliked, is that by the girl getting married without seeking permission from her parents or without their consent or blessing amounts to disobeying your parents, amounts to disrespecting your parents. Because obviously, if being a parent, now if you were to find out that your daughter, who you love so much, just ran away from home with a boy and then got married, that's going to hurt your feelings. So if a girl was to do that, it is obvious that it's going to hurt their parents, that what she has done is going to cause, to a certain extent, a bit of embarrassment to the family and to the parents. So in that way, you are giving them pain, you are indirectly giving them taklif, and this is something which is mentioned in the Holy Quran where Allah says, وَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ That do not say uf to your parents. And when we use the word uf, and even in the Arabic language as well, that uf doesn't just literally mean, or oh, don't say uf to your parents, but, or you can swear at your parents, or don't say uf to your parents, but you can disobey your parents. No, the meaning of uf means that anything which you know will hurt your parents, that is considered unlawful and haram. So whether you're saying the word oof to them, whether you're swearing at them, whether you're disobeying them, whether you're going and out against their will, you're going to you get married to another person without their knowledge, then that also comes under oof as well, and that is considered to be disobeying your parents, and that is considered to be disrespecting your parents. So basically in the Hanafi fiqh, what we say is that the nikah will be done if a girl was to get married without her parents' consent, however, it is considered disliked for the two reasons which I mentioned. One is that it is against modesty and haya, and the second reason is that one will be disobeying or will be considered as disobeying and disrespecting their parents for doing such a thing. And remember one point or one thing when it comes to disobeying or disrespecting your parents. It's mentioned in a hadith of Imam Bayhaqi Shu'ab al-Iman where he narrates that Rasulullah has said that disrespecting or disobeying one's parents is such a crime, it's such a jurm that the punishment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give in this world. Other kind of crimes which we do, like say adultery, thieving, backbiting and so on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we were to pass away without tawbah and without repentance, Allah will punish us in the year after. But disrespecting the parents is such a crime and it's such a sin that not only would you get punished for it in the year after, you will also get punished for it in this dunya and in this world. Now when we talk about Allah punishing us in this world, we don't mean like or like a like a some kind of like fire is going to come from the heaven and going to burn you in this world. No. What we mean is that something will happen to you in this world where when you look at it, it's actually a punishment for you disrespecting your parents. And what could that mean? 
and what could that entail? We see with our own eyes that what happens is that if we grew up disrespecting our parents and disobeying our parents, then when we have children, when we have sons, when we have daughters, they will do the exact same thing. And this is quite clearly mentioned in a hadith which can be found in Sunan al tirmidhi where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that if a youngster, a sharp, like a sharp here means a jawan or a youngster, if he grew up respecting his elders, so the hadith in Tirmidhi doesn't just talk about parents, it just says anyone old, whether it's your parents, whether it's the musallis in the local masjid, but if a youngster grew up, and he did khidmat of the elders, whether they were his parents, whether they were just normal old people, he looked after them, he respected them. Then the hadith of Sunan al-Tirmidhi goes on to say that when he gets old, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allocate and designate someone for him who will respect him and who will do his khidmat and who will look after him. So this is what we can gather here from the importance of respecting your elders, your parents, that you respect them, when you grow up somebody will be allocated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will look after you, who will respect you. However, you grow up disrespecting the elders, disrespecting your parents, then what will happen, and we see this with our own eyes, you'll be sent to a care home. You'll be sent to some other kind of home where no one will come there and look after you and will not look after you and respect you. So this is the two reasons why I mentioned why young girls, young boys should not get married without their consent from their parents. Why? Because it entails disrespecting and disobeying one's parents. Now, regarding this particular issue, I get this uh, kind of, a uh, lot of people always ask me this, that aren't we, in a certain extent, legalizing what these young boys and young girls are doing? People, they, all, they kind of throw this accusation at me and they say that, look, Mawlana Sahib, Mufti Sahib, you know, these boys and girls, they've run away from home and then they come to you and you do their nikah and then you say the nikah is done, they go to another Imam Sahib, the Imam Sahib does the nikah in private and then the nikah is done. And then people say, oh look, they're doing haram and now you're legalizing it by doing the nikah. Now, one should understand here that Remember, one of the attributes of Allah is Tawbah. The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts everyone's Tawbah and repentance. Now just because someone did something wrong or impermissible or haram before, you can't use that and you can't, like say for example, ridicule or humiliate or look down upon that person because of what he did wrong before. Just say for example, if a non-believer was to come to the masjid, and this non-believer, he's a, you know, like a fornicator, he's a thief, he's everything, he's everything. Now if he comes to you and he says, brother, I want to become a believer, are you going to say, no, no you, you know, you're a fornicator, I'm not going to make you a Muslim. Are you going to say that? No, you're going to first say to him that, yes, become a believer, and then afterwards, you know, make sure that you don't do these kind of sins again. That's why it's mentioned in the very famous hadith of Sahih Muslim, that there was that person who killed 99 times a mass murderer. So when he went to uh, Abid, someone who just worships Allah, and he said to him that, is there any toba? That person said, no, there isn't any toba for you. So what did that guy do? He killed him. So he now, had, he now killed 100 people. Then what happened? He then met an alim, a rahib, a scholar, and he then said to him that, is there any toba for me? So then that person said, yes, there is toba. Why? Because who can come between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then he told him that, go to such and such a place, and then as you know the story that he was going to that particular place, he passed away and the angels then, the Malakul Maut, i.e. the angels of Jannah, took his ruh and his soul. Now let's look at this particular example. He killed hundred people. And you no, know, killing someone, an innocent person, is a very, very great sin. But then what happened? That particular scholar said that there is still an opportunity for you to do Toba and repent from what you have done before. Now similarly, young boys and young girls, the relationship they have before marriage is haram. There's no doubt about that. What they have done running away from home and going into hiding or secret, whatever, that is also bad and wrong. But however, when you look at it from another angle, if they now want to go to an imam and say, look, imam sahab, we've done a mistake, 
yeah, like you know, we've been having a relationship which we know is haram, we run away from home, we know it's haram, but can you just, for example, do our nikah so that we can live a life in a halal way? Then when you look at it, at least they had the, you know, they had the thought of let's go to an imam, let's go to the local scholar, legalize this particular nikah. So when you look at it, they in a way are actually doing toba of their past. They're doing toba of what they have done. They are repenting for their previous actions. So therefore, if they come and say that, look, we want to do the nikah, we want to stop having this adulterous relationship, we want to have a lawful relationship, then no imam, no scholar should actually stop that particular person from doing the nikah. And plus on top of that, in the Hanafi fit, it's quite clearly mentioned that such a nikah is valid. So therefore, if somebody was to do a nikah in such a way, think of it that these boys and girls are actually doing toba for what they have done. They are repenting for the actions they made before, the misdemeanors they made before. So therefore, if they want to do toba, if they want to make the nikah halal, then there is nothing wrong with that. And as I mentioned in the Hanafi fiqh, we do say that such a nikah is valid, but dislike for the two reasons which are mentioned above. Now we're just going to look at the uh, hadiths here. The first two, three hadiths are very similar. The first hadith which can be found in Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, narrated by Abu Huraira al-Anhu, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, لا تنكه الأيم حتى تستأمر which means that uh, Ayyim, Ayyim is a woman who has been previously married. So just say for example, she was previously married, her husband divorced her, or just say for example, her husband passed away. And after she observes her Ibta, or her waiting period, the father now, i.e. the wali or the father of this particular girl, has now found another match, another groom for his daughter. So the hadith, what does he say? You can't get her married, Hatta tusta'mara, unless she gives clear and explicit permission. Unless she says clearly that, yes, okay, I want to get married to this particular groom, or I'm happy with this particular choice. Unless she, unless she says that clearly, the father would not be allowed to get her married. Hatta tusta'mara. Then he goes on to say, Wala tunkahul bikru hatta tusta'zara. That a virgin woman. Who, wasn't, who hasn't been married before, she's getting married for the first time. So again, the hadith says, وَلَا تُنْكَهُ الْبِكْرُ حَتَّى تُسْتَعْزَنَا That a father or a guardian or a wali is not allowed to force this girl to get married حَتَّى تُسْتَعْزَنَا unless permission or consent is sought from her. Unless you take permission from her. Then the companions asked, Ya Rasulullah, wa kayfa idnuha? How can we take permission from a virgin girl? Now why did the companions ask this? Is because a girl, a young girl, when she's getting married for the first time, because she's shy, she's not going to say clearly to her father or to her mother, or yes, I want to get married and so on. She's going to be a bit shy, modest about the whole situation. So how would we know what kind of signs should we look for what is the sign that, yes, she has agreed to the particular marriage? So therefore, Rasulullah replied by saying, Antaskuta, which means that her silence is considered to be permission. I.e., if the father was to ask the girl, and he said to the girl that, look, do you want to get married to such and such a person? And she kept quiet, then that is considered to be permission. That, yes, she has given her the thumbs up, she has consented to go ahead with the marriage and the nikah. Or like other examples which you mentioned in the books of fiqh, such as if she was to smile, that is considered to be permission. If she cried, but cried in a soft voice, that is like, like a few tears came from her eyes, then that is also considered to be permission. However, if she cried loudly or hysterically, or she explicitly said no, then that is not considered to be permission, hence the father would not be allowed to get this particular woman or girl married to the proposal or to the groom which he initially chose for her. The next hadith is also very similar, narrated by Ibn Abbas al-Anhu, where Rasulullah sallam has said, Al-ayyimu ahaqqu bi nafsiha min waliyiha. Again, ayyim here means a woman who has been previously married, ahaqqu bi nafsiha which means that she has more right over herself min waliyiha 
then her wali, then her custodian, then her father. Again, trying to imply that if a woman who has already been previously married, she doesn't actually need permission from her father if she wants to get married the second time. Similarly, if the father does find someone for, the, uh, for his daughter who has already been previously married before, then as I mentioned before, she has to give the father explicit and clear permission and consent before the father goes ahead with the proposal and the marriage. And the hadith goes on to say, Well, fikru to sta'zanu fi nafsiha wa idnuha sumatuha, which means that a uh, virgin girl, a uh, girl who hasn't been married before, then you need to seek permission from her, and her permission is sumatuha, is her silence. And the next hadith thereafter, again, we touched on this last week as well, narrated by Khansa bin Khizam radil anha, again, this touched on about the issue of post marriage where her father zawwajaha wa hiya sayyibun fakarihat zalika which means that her father forcefully got her married without her consent wa hiya sayyibun and she was previously married before which as we looked at in the aforementioned two hadiths entails that you need to get explicit permission from her but what did the father do without getting permission from her he forcefully uh, got her married to someone so the hadith goes on to say, فَأَتَتْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. She came to Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. She complained that what her father had done. Then the hadith goes on to say, فَرَدَّ نِكَاهَهَا That Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم then cancelled her marriage, which her father had done without her consent. Now three hadiths which I've mentioned, and when we look through or analyze each of the three ahadith, is telling us, quite clearly that forced marriages is not a teaching of Islam. Quite clearly, as you can see from the hadith, quite clearly Rasulullah some clear words, clearly saying that, look, if you want to get your daughter, your granddaughter, your younger sister married, you need to get her permission. How clear, look, how clear the ahadith are, hatta to sta'zana. You need to get permission from her. Even the third hadith, which is even more clear, when he tells us that once it did happen that one of the female companions her father got mad without her consent, what did Rasulullah do? Farad the nikaha. Straight away cancelled the marriage and abolished the marriage. So what we can understand is that forced marriages is not a teaching of Islam. It never was a teaching of Islam. And those who think or assume it was a teaching of Islam, then very simply you have been mistaken. It's never ever been a teaching of Rasulullah. 1400 years ago, Rasulullah abolished such a custom. It was common before Rasulullah's time in during the days of ignorance, during the days of Jahiliyyah. It was common, but as soon as Islam came, Rasulullah totally abolished such a nikah and such a marriage. And then you may argue and say, well, it does happen nowadays. It does happen, but it's not a teaching of Islam. It's more a cultural thing. It's more people through their ignorance and jahala thinking that it was a it's an Islamic teaching, and then using that as a shield to then say, yes, I'm, getting, I'm forcefully going to get my daughter married or my granddaughter married. It's actually not a teaching of Islam. It's more of a cultural thing. And as I mentioned last week, that look, the difference between culture and Islam is like the difference between the heaven and the earth. No comparison whatsoever. So as you can see clearly from the three hadiths, forced marriages has not been a teaching of Islam, and it's never ever been and it never ever will be a teaching of Islam. Now the next hadith is a very important hadith, especially in this day and age. A lot of questions and objections are raised. The hadith which can be found in Sahih Muslim, narrated by Sayyida Aisha al-Anha, where it says that Rasulullah got married to her, وَهِيَ بِنْتُ سَبْعِ سِنِينَ when she was the age of seven. In a hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, he explains the age of six. And then the hadith goes on to say, وَزُفَّتْ إِلَيْهِ وَهِيَ بِنْتُ تِسْئِ سِنِينَ And she went to live with Rasulullah when she was nine years old. There's another part of the hadith, but we'll probably look at it later. Now, the first part of the hadith, as you can imagine, has raised a lot of objection nowadays. 
is that how did Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam marry a girl, I say the Aisha the Anha, when she was only six years old, and then on top of that, this young girl at the age of nine goes and starts living with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. At that time, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was in his fifty. 50s, approximately, he was around 50 years old. Sayyidah Aisha Danha was 6. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he marries a young girl of 6, and then this young girl, at the age of 9, starts living with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, initially, this particular objection was raised by people from other groups, from other sects. But slowly, slowly, what happened was that many Muslims started then questioning this particular marriage. They started saying that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marrying a six-year-old girl, how can that be possible? How could he have done that? To the extent that, we're talking about Muslims here, it led to many Muslims making, how shall I put it, blasphemous remarks, you could say, derogatory comments about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marriage with Sayyidah Aisha radil anha. And as you know that if someone was to make any blasphemous comments about any aspect of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa life, whether about his sunnah, about his ways, even about his family, about the Ahl bayt even about his azwaj or his wife, then such a person would not remain in the fold of Islam. Something which is very serious. And unfortunately many Muslims you speak to, they kind of raise question marks about how was it possible? How can Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa have done that? So therefore we need to look at this particular hadith and we need to look at the wisdoms, we need to look at why did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marry Sayyidah Aisha the Anha at such a young age. Now before we look at the reason, just a few things with regards to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marriage with Sayyidah Aisha the Anha. As all of you know that Sayyidah Aisha the Anha was the daughter of Abu Bakr radil anhu. And Abu Bakr al Anhu had two wives. The first one was called Qayla bint Mahrama. And when Abu Bakr al Anhu became a Muslim and she declined to follow in his footsteps and become a Muslimah, Abu Bakr al Anhu divorced her and he then married Umm Ruman radil Anha. And it was from Umm Ruman radil Anha Sayyid Aisha Anha was born. Now what happened was, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's first wife, Khadija radil anha, passed away, a female companion in the name of Khawla came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that your household is sadly being neglected. Your young daughters, Fatima, Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kalsum, they are in need of someone to look after them, someone to help them, someone to assist them. Then Khawla gave Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mashwara of two women. And she said that if you want to marry someone old, someone who could look after your household, then I suggest Sauda bint Zam'a radil anha. However, if you want to marry someone young, then I suggest the daughter of Abu Bakr radil anhu, I say the Aisha radil anha. Now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then said to Khawla that give proposal to both, both Sauda and to Aisha radil anha. Now Khawla then went to Abu Bakr radil anhu and he asked Abu Bakr radil anhu for Sayyidah Aisha the Anha's hand in marriage to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, Rasul, now Abu Bakr radil anhu then turned around and he said to Khawla that look Mut'im bin Adi who at that time was a mushrik, was an idol worshipper, a pagan of Mecca he few days ago came to me and he wanted to marry his son Ali Jubair with my daughter Aisha radha anha and I accepted the proposal and then Abu Bakr radha anhu then said to Khawla that this has been my 
sunnah or my way that whenever I have made a promise, I have never ever broken a promise. SubhanAllah, look at Abu Bakr al-Anhu that look, if he, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asking for his daughter's hand, but he said that look, I've made a promise. Now look, who did he make a promise with? He wasn't with a Muslim, he was with a pagan. But he even said that look, I don't want to break a promise. Even though he may be a mushrik, even though he's not a Muslim, I don't want to break this promise which I made with him. So Abu Bakr al-Anhu said to Khawlaa that look, sorry, I can't really do anything. I've already given my word to uh, Mut'im bin Abi for his son. So, I can't really say yes or no at this moment in time. Now, what Abu Bakr al-Anhu did promise Khawla is that, look, I'll go and speak to Mut'im bin Adi and I'll see that what's the situation and see are they still willing to get their son Jubair married to my daughter Aisha Danha. Now, Abu Bakr al-Anhu then went to Mut'im bin Adi. He then said to Mut'im bin Adi that, what are your intentions? Do you want to, your son to get married to my daughter? Now, Mut'im bin Adi didn't say anything. He just gestured to his wife. And then his wife spoke and she said that we fear that if our son Jubair was to marry your daughter Aisha, we fear that he will also forego or let go of his forefather's religion. Now, soon as uh, Mut'im bin Adi's wife said this, Abu Bakr al-Anhu then realized that they weren't really interested in this particular marriage. So then Abu Bakr al-Anhu realized that, look, this particular proposal is going to be called off now, the engagement is going to be called off, and thereafter he then accepted the proposal of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Now, before we look at the reasons or the wisdom why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa got married to her, first and foremost, it's quite clearly mentioned in the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari that this marriage of Rasulullah sallam to Aisha al-Anha wasn't because of any natural desires, wasn't because of any human desires. But in fact, it was actually an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Rasulullah sallam should get married to Sayyidah Aisha al-Anha. And in the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, it's mentioned that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a dream he saw a picture and this picture was in a silk kind of robe and it was said to him, or the angel said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that open this silk garment or this silk curtain and you will find a picture and that particular person, whoever's picture is, you will marry her. So then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam opened it and it was the picture of Sayyida Aisha Danha. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then said that, look, if this was meant to happen, then it will happen. So what we can gather from this particular dream is that it was actually an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to marry Sayyida Aisha Danha. Remember, for a prophet, when he sees a dream, that is considered to be a form of divine revelation. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw this, it was actually a message from Allah that, look, you need to marry Sayyida Aisha Danha. So putting all the wisdom to the side, first and foremost, it's an order from Allah. And remember, whenever Allah gives an order, you have to do it. And that's what submission is, that's what Islam is, that you submit to Allah's commands and orders. Look at Ibrahim alayhi salam, that when he was told by Allah that you have to sacrifice your son, he didn't ask the reasons why. He didn't say that, oh look, my son, you know, I love him so much, how can I sacrifice my son? No, he straight away went and he was about to sacrifice his son. So similarly here as well, that when Allah gives the order, that you have to do this, then you do it, all the prophets and messengers do it. Why? Because that's the whole meaning of Islam, that's the whole meaning of submitting yourself to Allah's will and to Allah's commands and orders. So that's one reason. Now if you want to look at it from the, the hikmah and the wisdom point of view, point of view that why did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam marry Sayyidah Aisha anha First reason is that it's difficult for us to compare 2011 with over 1400 years ago. Certain things which are considered appropriate now or certain things which we did now was not done over 1400 years ago. And certain things which they did over 1400 years ago, we don't do it now. Take an example like over 1400 years ago, there wasn't any toilets around. So if they needed to pass urine or stool, 
They will go somewhere in the jungle, they will go in the forest, they will go somewhere outside and they will do it. Now if we were to do it now in this country, we were to go outside the bushes and we were to urinate and do stool, we get arrested. So what I'm trying to say is that there are certain things which based on culture, based on say for example according to what it was in those days, you can't use the same shall I say, broom or the brush for what we do in this day and age and vice versa. Now what I'm trying to say is that in those days, a girl of nine years old was not considered to be a young girl. She was considered to be a young woman. Nowadays girls are around eight, nine, they don't have that understanding, they don't have that, as we say, so much or understanding, they don't have the occult, they don't have the intellect. But girls in those days, at the age of nine, they were capable, they were able to run a whole household. They were able to cook, they would be able to do all the sweeping, the grooming, they were able to do all the household chores. They were able to live like a wife does in her 20s in this day and age, a girl of nine was able to do in those days. So therefore you can't use the, the comparison of a young nine-year-old in this day and age who is basically subjected or is mukallaf of her parents need ed, ed, or, you know, for all the assistance she needs her parents. You can't use the same example for a young girl in those days. That's one reason. Another reason is that when we look at the pagans and the mushrikeen of Rasulullah's lifetime, they made many, many accusations against Rasulullah. They would call him he's a magician, they would say that Naudubillah is a liar. They would make so many accusations. But one accusation they never made was Rasulullah marrying Sayyidah Aisha Danha at the age of six. Now what I'm trying to say is that if he was considered something wrong in those days, then you could imagine Abu Lahab, Abu Jahal, they would have used that to again ridicule Rasulullah They would have accused Rasulullah that why has he married a young girl at the age of six? They would have ridiculed him, they would have mocked him, they would have jested him, they would have said so many bad things and immoral things about Rasulullah marrying a young girl of age of six. But because no one did it, they used other kind of accusations about him being a magician, him being a sorcerer, but no one leveled that particular accusation that is indicating that even in those days, he wasn't considered something wrong or something impermissible, something unlawful for a young girl of age of six to be married to a person who was at that time the age of 50. So that's another reason. A third reason, again, which can be found in a hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, it's a long hadith, but I'm just mentioned one part of the hadith, when it says that Sayyidah Aisha al-Anha, when she was nine years old and then she then went to live with Rasulullah in the hadith of Sayyid al-Bukhari, it narrates that Sayyidah Aisha al-Anha, before she went to live with Rasulullah the words of the hadith are that she fell ill and her f- hair fell. Now from there the scholars have derived that the meaning of this hadith that Sayyidah Aisha al-Anha falling ill and her hair falling is indicating that she at the age of nine reached the age of puberty. That her body went underwent some kind of process. Her falling ill is referring to her for, uh, having her periods. So what we can derive is that she at the age of nine went, underwent some kind of like changes, hormones and so on. And then afterwards she then went to live with Rasulullah So basically at the age of nine we can see that she reached the age of puberty. So that's like a third reason. Another reason why or another kind of wisdom, and this is like the main reason why Rasulullah got married to say the Aisha Danha, is because, again, this is like another kind of objection which people have is that why Rasulullah married so many wives, he married 11 times altogether, is that Rasulullah's marriage was done for many, many reasons or many, many benefits. Wisdom. There was kind of a hikmah or a particular reason why Rasulullah married so many women. Now there are three reasons why or Rasulullah in particular chose Sayyidah Aisha Anha at that particular age. The first reason it's mentioned in the hadith is that the Arabs they would consider marriage in the month of Shawwal, sorry not in the month of Shawwal, the month of Safar, 
to be a bad marriage. Like any kind of nikah or marriage which takes place in the month of Safar, they consider it to be like a bad omen. They consider that particular month to be prohibited for marriage. Now what did Rasulullah do? He got married to Sayyidah Aisha Danaha when? During the month of Safar. To show to people that look, marriage in the month of Safar is something which is allowed and permissible. And also Sayyidah Aisha Danaha would also say this as well. That look, how can the month of Safar be a bad month when I got married to Rasulullah and I am the most blessed out of all the wives of Rasulullah So that's one reason. Again, Rasulullah practically eradicating an evil custom or an innovation or a bid, I could say. Another kind of bad custom or an evil custom which was ripe in those days is that the Arabs, they would not give the hands of their daughters to those who they call their brothers. I.e., someone, just an example like Rasulullah and Bakr al who they were very close, they were very close friends, to the extent that they would consider each, each other to be a brother. Not brother in terms of lineage or in reality, but just in terms of respect and love. Now what happened was that in those days, if somebody was just considered to be brothers or you love this particular person and you treated him like your own brother, they would not give their daughter's hand to that particular person. Why? Because they consider him to be like his own brother in the same way that your own brother can't marry your own daughter that is unlawful and haram. Similarly, they would not give their uh, own daughter to those people who they started calling brothers, but in reality they were not brothers. And this was very common in Rasulullah time. There's a very famous story of Zayd bin Harith al Anhu. He was an adopted son. But in those days what happened, an adopted son was considered to be one real son. So again Rasulullah was then told by Allah, sorry, was Allah then told Rasulullah to marry Sayyida Zainab bin Jahsh anha, who was the divorced wife of Zayd bin Harith anhu to eradicate a further custom which was that one's adopted son is not considered to be your own true and real son. So again, this was another reason why Rasulullah got married to Sayyidah Aisha Danha, why to eradicate that particular custom that look, just because someone through love or friendship you consider him to be a brother, he doesn't become your real brother in terms of his daughters become haram upon you and your daughters become haram upon him. And the third main reason why Rasulullah got married to Sayyidah Aisha Danha was because of knowledge, because of it. Because when we look through hadith literature in particular, one third of all the ahadiths which are found in your Bukhari, in your Sahih Muslim, in your Sunan Tirmidhi, Sunan Abu Dawood, they have been narrated by Sayyidah Aisha Danha. Sayyidah Aisha Danha, you could say, was a female muhaddisa. She was a female muhaddis, a female scholar of hadith. She passed on so much knowledge from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to the companions, to other people, to the tabi'ins, and to the successors. And so many things about Rasulullah's life, in particular at home. Because when you look at it, Rasulullah, when he was in the masjid and he would give lectures and he would pray salah, many companions would observe that and they saw this, they heard this, and then they started narrating it. But there are many things which Rasulullah did at home which the companions could not see such as Rasulullah Salah, how Rasulullah was at home, how did he behave with his wife, these kind of things, and that can only be narrated by his wife. No one else, a male companion couldn't narrate it. About say, Rasulullah and a male companion would not be able to narrate that. How Rasulullah say rules regarding intercourse, jima, these kind of things, only the wife of Rasulullah could have narrated that. So when you look at it, the reason why Rasulullah got married to Sayyidah Aisha Danha and also the other wife is so that his life and his practice and his words at home can also then be passed on to other people. Because just imagine Rasulullah didn't get married or didn't get married to so many wives. Then what, how Rasulullah was at home, we wouldn't know how he was. How he behaved, how he prayed his tahajjud salah, you know, how he was in terms of like the household chores and so on, how he behaved with his wife, we wouldn't have known that. 
So these are, and again, another reason why Rasulullah Sallallahu married so many times and why Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi married Sayyidah Aisha Dana at a young age is to pass and convey the ocean and ocean of knowledge which Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had. Well, like it was the topic to act on us, we said, Wa'afiru da'wan, alhamdulillah.